Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Worth Fighting For. I want to say a big thank you to all of our veterans. I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you, veterans. May the Lord bless you. May he bless you richly. I also want to recognize the families of veterans. Thank you. This Friday, November the 11th, we will be celebrating Veterans Day. This is the day we, as a nation, have set aside to honor those brave soldiers who have selflessly served their country in time of war and in time of peace. Veterans Day is not the same as Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a day that we honor the fallen soldiers, those who made the ultimate sacrifice by giving their lives in defense of their countries. They will never be forgotten. They gave their lives for what they believed in, freedom. Veterans Day is the day we honor those veterans who served and are still alive to tell their stories. You know, Veterans Day originally was known as Armorist Day and is observed on November the 11th of every year. It marked the end of World War I, which officially ended on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918. But in 1954, Amherst Day was renamed the Veterans Day at the prompting of a few major U.S. veteran organizations. This is a celebration that is recognized all over the world. Though they may call it different names like Remembrance Day, but it all started with celebrating the end of World War I and honoring those brave soldiers who fought in that awful and dreadful war. Turn with me please to our scripture, 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2 through 4. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the, the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. You know, there are millions of veterans who have bravely fought for what they believed in. They fought for their country. They fought for their freedoms. Throughout the centuries, throughout the centuries, from time began, wars been happening, men have been fighting, armies have been found, have been formed, and men, veterans, have been fighting for what they believed in. They thought it was worth putting their lives on the line to defend their way of life, to defend their freedom. Then there are those veterans, like me, who did not see combat, but we were just as ready to face the enemy and to protect what we feel that and what we hold so dear and near to us. That is, our freedom, our family, our country. It's all worth fighting for. There are many things that we fight over today, that things that are not even worth mentioning, much less fighting for. But what is worth fighting for is our salvation, our freedom to worship, our marriages, and our families. You know, the desire to serve in the military is dwindling for whatever reason. Over the years, less and less people are signing up for the military. It's estimated that less than 1% of the nation has served in the military since 9-11. There are young people now growing up that they don't even know a veteran personally or so one report said, the report that I read. Serving in the military, I believe, is an essential job. 
but it can be a thankless job. Young service members are sent into harm's way as they're rushed off to fight a battle, rushed off to fight a war that they did not start, that they did not believe in many times. Many forfeit their lives, and many forfeit the lives that they could have had because many come back injured. They come home paralyzed. They come home with missing limbs and a whole lot of psychological problems. Many are diagnosed with PTSD. The benefits that soldiers should have, the, the, the benefits that is theirs do not exist. Veterans return home to find themselves homeless without jobs. Some of them find themselves without families. The Vietnam vets returned home to violent verbal abuse, strong words of criticism, insult from those they thought that they were defending. They came home to cursings and even being spit upon. It is never the veteran's choice to start the war, but they do their patriotic duty and they fight the war that was started for them. We appreciate you brave veterans. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for fighting for us. Thank you for defending and protecting our freedom. We honor you. We bless you. But we, who have never experienced combat, do not appreciate the horrors of war. When those who are safe and sound in secure buildings, hundreds of miles away from the scene of the fighting, sometimes even thousands of miles away, are the ones who are calling the shots. I want you to look at this video of Dakota Meyer, a Medal of Honor recipient, as he recalls the battle that earned him his medal. Four Marines were trapped in the village of Ganjgal after a patrol of nine Americans, both Marines and Army soldiers, and 45 Afghan military was ambushed. Afterwards, the Army Center for Lessons Learned produced this animated recreation of what happened. The patrol set out for what was supposed to be a friendly meeting with village elders. Rocky terrain forced them to get out of their armored vehicles and move in on foot. They're walking up toward the village. Uh, what happens next? Right at daylight, they open fire on them. Uh, the, the enemy starts, starts uh, raining down. Um, they had mortars, rockets, um, rocket propelled grenades, and uh, small arms fire. They were waiting for you. They were. This was an ambush. Oh, it was. We were set up. With an estimated 100 to 150 enemy fighters dug in on the high ground above them, the Marines called for artillery fire from a nearby base. The first rounds missed, so First Lieutenant Michael Johnson, one of the four Marines trapped inside the village, radioed new coordinates of the enemy positions. But the commanders in the operations center back at the base refused to fire. They denied it. Uh, the Army denied it and, and told him it was, it was too close to the village. And he said, too close to the village. And the last words I heard him say was, if you don't give me these rounds right now, I'm going to die. Did he get the artillery fire? No, he didn't. Um, the response was basically, try your best. An investigation conducted after the battle determined that two Army officers making those decisions in the operations center that day were clearly negligent. The actions of key leaders in the command center, the report said, were inadequate and ineffective, contributing directly to the loss of life which ensued. Because of what the report calls poor performance in an atmosphere of complacency, the operations center just did not realize how bad the situation was until it was too late. By the time that young man got to those soldiers that were pinned down, they were all dead. He risked his life for what? It could have been prevented if they had only called in 
the air support. Call them backup. There's nothing fancy or exciting about war. It's death and pain for those who fight. It's money and power for those who finance it. But those who have to fight the war, it's living hell. But there is a better way. There is a commander in chief that will never leave you and will never forsake you. There's a warrior that will always have your back. He will always come in time of trouble and will not leave you to die. He will never deny you help. His name is Jesus. I bet you didn't know it, but Jesus is a veteran too. He fought the battle for your soul. He fought the battle for my soul and he won. But like veterans today, it was not his war. But he thought it was a war worth fighting. Because to him, you and me are worth fighting for. We were hopelessly lost. It was only the mercy of Jesus to get up off of his throne and enter our world and step into our time as a helpless little baby through a Jewish virgin by the name of Mary to fight the greatest battle of all, the battle for our souls. But someone might say, Brother Kenneth, that could be heresy to say that Jesus is a warrior. Okay, then let us turn to the scriptures. Let us call up our two witnesses to prove that the Lord is a warrior. First, let us call Moses. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. That's pretty plain to me. Now let's turn to our second witness, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 13. The Lord goes out like a mighty man. Like a man of war, he stirs up his seal. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. God is a warrior. And he's always, always fighting for you. And he's fighting for me. He's always fighting for us and with us. When we can't fight for ourselves because the enemy has us pinned down, or maybe the enemy is just too strong for us, our ally, Jesus, the Son of God, will come and will bring us back up. He will fight for us. The psalmist asks a question, and then immediately he answers his own question. Psalms 24 Verse 8, who is this king of glory? The answer, the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. He has never lost one battle, and he has never been defeated in war. Praise his name. Jesus gave his life in battle, yes, but it was in order to save us, to save you, and to save me, his brothers and his sisters and his joint heirs. He hung on the cross of Calvary on that dark and dreadful day when he became the sacrifice for our sins. It was the only way. There was no other way. But by giving his life, he actually won the war because on the third day, he was raised to life again. And now he reigns supreme from the heavens. He is seated at the right hand of power. Look at Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Having won the war for our souls, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the, God, of the Father, and now he is recruiting soldiers to fight this great spiritual war. Will you join the fight? Will you join the war? Will you be recruited? He's looking for men and women like you, like me, who will stand 
and fight. And after doing all to stand, we must therefore stand. We need spiritual soldiers to help fight the spiritual war. Spir spiritual soldiers with spiritual discernment for spiritual things because the enemy is not flesh and blood, but they're spiritual. The enemy are the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We will never have total victory with doubt looming so large. The kind of doubt that disbelieves that there is an actual spiritual world war that exists and is going on right now all around us. But we need to fight this war. We need to fight against racism in the church, division over abortion or a woman's right to choose. We need to fight against all forms of sexual immorality that has overtaken the whole world and has even wiggled its way into the church. We need to fight for our families. We need to fight for our commitment to them. As it is, the divorce rate in the church is just as high as the divorce rate in the world. One out of two marriages end in divorce. We need to fight for our families as our children are targeted with this dysphoria phenomenon. We need to fight against the occult and against witchcraft that is now a normal part of our society. And many, many are turning to it. Many are even leaving the faith to turn to it. And there are many other spiritual battles that need to be fought. Like we should be fighting for unity in the church. We should be arguing for more love in the church. We should be seeking for more self-sacrificing in the church. But as it is, we're fighting the battles that the enemy wants us to fight. Battles that keep us separated. Battles that keep us divided. Because if they keep us divided, they keep us conquered. It is a spiritual war that each and every one of us must fight. In the end, if you choose the right side, the side of Jesus, the giver of life, it will be worth fighting for. We need men and women of honor Men and women who are willing to lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel and for the love of the brethren. I want us to look at what Jesus said at John chapter 15, verse 12 through 13. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friend. The gospel must be preached to all the world at any cost. People must hear. People must be saved. Yes, I realize that there are some who do hear, but do not want to hear, and that's unfortunate. They say that they're so sick and tired of hearing about this Jesus. They do not want to hear another word about Jesus. But let me just say this. Jesus is the only one who has the words of life. He alone is the life giver. Some of our veterans served in peacetime. Some served during time of war. And they fought bravely to preserve our lifestyle to preserve our freedoms and our rights. But all served willingly, whether in peace or whether in wartime. They served, we served, even some to the laying down of their lives. Let's not be so quick to give in. Let's not be so quick to give it all 
away to the elites who say that they're for us when they're not for us at all, but are looking out for their own best interests. The proof is always, always, always in the pudding, not in what they say or what the media tries to program us to believe. It's in the actions. Just look at the actions. Judge the actions. Let's not be too quick to discount what Jesus did for us on the cross. He's the only one that has the power to set us free. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I know many of us are weary from all the battles. The constant attacks are wearing us down. The feeling of giving in and giving up is a real thing. It's real. I realize that. But I want to encourage you to hold on. Jesus is coming back for us, and he's coming back real soon. Our commander-in-chief is on his way back to get us. And those who oppose him, they and their systems will be dismantled. So look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. In closing, let me encourage you with the prose that I wrote several years ago. I wrote this in 2007, January the 11th, 2007. A soldier, bloody and battered, bruised and weary from the stream of constant battle, stumbled towards the gates of thanksgiving. As the soldier staggered on, he kept saying in his heart, I will not give up. I will not give in. I will not be defeated. The soldier entered the gates of thanksgiving and began giving thanks for the victories he had won, the closed battles God had brought him through. He began thanking God for the mountains, for the valleys, for he started to understand that when he passed through the valley of the shadow of death, God was with him. God's rod and staff had given him comfort. He gave thanks and praise for all the blessings he had received during times of battle. As a soldier walked through the gates of thanksgiving, he entered the courts of praise and threw his hands in the air as he recognized his sustainer and began praising God for who he is. Oh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, you are God Almighty, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He who was dead and now is alive, the Alpha, the Omega, mighty God, Prince of Peace, the author and finisher of our faith. Savior, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, Emmanuel, God with us. There in the courts of praise, the soldier washed the mud of disappointment, the sweat of doubt, the blood of past defeat from his body. Then he laid his body upon the brazen altar as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Before long, the weary soldier found himself in a holy place where he ate the bread of the presence, the living bread that gave him sustenance. And he looked at the golden lampstand. He realized what the real fight was about to let the world know that Jesus is the light of the world and no one comes to Father except by him. He walked past the altar of incense where smoke rose, mixed with the prayers of the saints that have been poured out from golden vows and is brought before God as a lasting memorial. With an unveiled face, the soldier steps into the most holy place where the mercy seat of God is and where God's presence abides. Knowing fully well that the curtain once divided the holy place from the most holy place had been torn from top to bottom, opening the way to approach God's throne in confidence and with boldness, the soldier steps in. He sees the floor is of pure gold, so pure it is though it is transparent. The walls are built of every imaginable precious stone. 
Upon the soldier's head is the helmet of salvation. The breastplate of righteousness is shining and gleaming in the brilliant light. In his hand he is tightly holds the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And in his other hand he clutches the shield of faith, which extinguishes all the fiery darts of the evil one. The belt of truth is tightly girded around his waist, and his feet are shrouded with the gospel of peace. The click, clock, click, clock of the soldier's boots echoes throughout the room. The sound of the gospel of peace echoing throughout the world. He comes to a standstill in front of the throne of grace and looks upon his face and cries, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He falls to his knees with his face to the floor and his hands outstretched. The angels begin to sing, to him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power and dominion forever and ever. There was a sound of many voices crying, Amen and Amen. And everyone began to worship him who sat upon the throne. Then he who sat upon the throne stood up and with a sword he touched the soldier on each shoulder and said, you are a child of God. You are more than a conqueror. You are mighty upon the earth. You are blessed and highly favored. You are rich and not poor. You are strong and not weak. For I have given you a future full of hope, a future of peace and joy and happiness. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Now go and conquer in the name of my son, Jesus Christ. For I have anointed you to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to those in bondage, to bring recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. I have given you dominion and power to drive out demons, to speak in new tongues, to tread in serpents and scorpions, and to drink any deadly poison without harm. You have authority and power to heal the sick. The lame will walk at your command. Blind eyes will open and deaf ears will be unplugged. You have the authority to pull down strongholds and to take back that which was stolen from you. Now go in the name of your Lord and Savior, my son, Jesus Christ. Ask me anything in his name and it will be done for you. And remember... If God is for you, who can be against you? For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. With those words ringing triumphantly in his ears, the very soldier stood to his feet. His demeanor changed. His weariness gone as he understood that the kingdom of God suffered violence and a violent take it by force. So let me ask you, are you a soldier in the Lord's army? Do you know your commander in chief? Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? And if you haven't, let me invite you today. Let today be the day because Jesus is soon coming back. If you want to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, Say this prayer with me and believe it in your heart. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Make me strong and mighty upon the earth that I might fight the spiritual battle, that I might not take enemies, that I might not take prisoners, but that I might fight the spiritual war. I realize our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's all fought in the spiritual. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for fighting for me, for fighting the battle you did not have to fight, but you won the battle. You saved 
my soul. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your free gift of life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I want to encourage you to buy a Bible, read your Bible. That is your sword. That is your weapon. That is what will, will deliver you. That's what will defend you. So read that word, God's word, every day. Memorize scripture that you might use during times of temptation, through it, during times of, of, of feeling down and depressed. The word will defend you. Jesus will defend his word. Find a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches that believe that they can do whatever they want, but a Bible-believing church that believes there's still a right way and a wrong way, who still believes that thus saith the Lord. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. So I want to say a prayer for all the veterans. Lord, I just lift up these veterans to you. Some of our veterans are homeless. Some of them are destitute. Some are jobless. Some are suffering with psychological problems, regret, memories of war. I pray, oh Lord God, for our healing touch. I pray the peace Shalom, peace over each veteran. I rebuke that spirit of depression, that harassing spirit of suicide. I rebuke you now in the name of Jesus. And I speak life. I speak peace. Shalom, peace. I speak healing over each veteran and their families. Receive what Jesus has for you now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Again, I want to say thank you to all of our veterans. And let you know that we appreciate you very much. The Lord bless you richly. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.